So, in order to check compliance for free movement, you have to do the following. You've got three things to consider. One is you need to be within plus and minus 15 millimeters of a datum. Uh, you need to follow the pattern that you had, which was part of the genesis of the, of the narrow aisle. And under the circumstances, you are now picking up situations like this, like that. So how many of those tests are you going to do? What you're looking for is what is known as property two. Property two is giving you the short wave characteristics, and it tells you that if you're going to get a, a, a picture of how good a, 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 a free movement area floor is, you're going to take the area of the floor, in this example is 900 square meters, and you're going to run property two over a tenth of that in linear meters. So 900 square meters equals 90 meters. 9,000 equals 900. You're thinking about that measuring instrument again, aren't you? Okay. Half of them need to run in north-south direction. Half of them need to run east-west. So you don't want to do it? That's fine, because the same clever guys who invented the profilograph invented a gadget called a property two reader. It half looks like a profilograph, but it isn't. It's not driven. It's towed. Um, it collects information, that's downloaded, and that ends up in a report that looks something like that. So regardless of what you get in terms of what is happening, it is translated so that you've got a visual reproduction of it, and you can see whether or not the floor complies. And it's a question of to what degree does it comply. Those are the limits. Those are the specifications. Once again, in terms of looking at specifications, they relate to rack heights that you're likely to encounter or the standard that the developer or the engineer requires you to have applied to that floor. And you get a report at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the property to reader that tells you what you have actually achieved, your run length and so on and so forth. So you've marked where you've taken these and if you've got problems, you would have to deal with them in some shape or form. That leaves you with dealing with the other aspect which is levelness. Now, this is the pain in the backside, but this is the way it's done. You need to set up a grid over the entire building. So if you've got 9,000, 90,000 square meters, you have to set up a three meter by three meter grid. You have to take, first of all, pick up where your datum is so that you know you've got a, you've got a baseline. You need a leveling instrument that is accurate to 0.1 of a millimeter. I've seen reports that have been generated by people who don't have much idea. They've all been approximated to the nearest millimeter, which is real fun. At the end of the day, if you ain't got an instrument that can measure to that degree of accuracy, then you're not getting a true picture. That data is, is collected by the same PDA that you use with the Property 2 reader. These are the limits that you're looking at. That is what it looks like when it comes out as a report to the PDA. And that is the analysis that it does for you. So it tells you your lowest point of and highest points of elevation. It tells you what the greatest difference in elevation is in any one case. You look, if you see various yellow spots around the shape, this wasn't a bad floor because there are none that are, that are covered with, uh, with a red um, border. Any results that are outside of the permissible range are indicated with the yellow block. If they're over the outer limit, they've got a red block around them. If you can't survey because there's something in the way or, if, or that you need to stay away from columns because that's notorious for levels going to hell because the building contractor put those levels in. He also put in the dock levelers. Uh, we found dock levelers over 2.8 meters. We've had 48 millimeter difference in elevation between two points when a guy's trying to achieve an FM2 special floor. So who coordinates? I don't know, but that's it. Back to the results, the percentage of results over 6.5 millimeters, as you see there, is 2.1% on that particular floor. You are allowed five, so you're inside the bracket. None of the results are over 10 millimeters, therefore nowhere do you exceed. The other interesting one is the standard deviation, which the committee of uh, TR34 has um, arrived at a situation where they're actually considering uh, looking at that standard deviation. Now, all standard deviation is, it's an accumulation of figures that are plus and minus either side of the limit line. So if you're allowed 8 millimeter difference in elevation, say, between 2.3 meters apart, you're looking at a standard deviation curve that covers 4 mil up or 4 mil down. Therefore, you can argue 
What's the point? Well, the point is this, that if this guy on this floor ended up with standard deviation 2.68, and Joe Soap, who's not as good as this guy, ended up with 3.99, you can guess for yourself which guy had the better floor. Both of them pass. Which guy had the better floor? Okay. So there you go. So we now got to 1994 when that came out. So now we've got situations that can cater for any warehouse or industrial floor, normally warehouses because that's of particular interest and concern to safe and efficient operation of equipment. So TR34 guys came up with a tree. And this tree is actually hellishly simple to understand, but apparently in South Africa we don't read too well. It says you choose the floor type. Let's go to the left-hand side. This is 2014, okay? We've got defined movement areas. For you to apply any of these specifications on the left-hand side in blue, you have to know where the racks are going to be. Why? Because if you can't say where that truck is going to run, any interpretation you do ends up being meaningless. If you took it here and you move the thing over 500 millimeters, the whole bloody thing is invalid. So you've got to know where those aisles are. If you don't know where they are, then you shoot across to the other side, and I'll deal with aspects of that in a moment, but you then go to a free movement specification. I have seen guys calling for profilograph readings on a free movement area floor. If you can only use a profilograph in a, in a VNA application, what the hell are you asking for profilograph readings for a situation where you can't define where the truck's going to run? If I'm striking a chord with anybody, listen to me carefully. Thank you. Depending on your rack height, you'd now, you now pick one or other of the specifications. So in 2014, fourth edition TR34, you wouldn't find the word super flat anymore. You'd find the, word DM, the, the expression DM1, defined movement 1, which is the equivalent of European standard EN15620. That means nothing to you, means little to me, but that is what truck manufacturers put in terms of their specification requirements for a floor to suit their type of equipment. If your rack height is, is um, between 8 meters and 13 meters, you'll now get what was CAT 1, now DM2. Under 8 meters, what was CAT 2, now becomes DM3. And I made mention of it before, I'll make mention of it again. For all those guys who cheat and drop from 13125 to 12875, you're not serving your client in any shape or form. Over the other side, it becomes a debatable issue. The higher you're going to lift, and normally for a, a, um, a, a reach truck, you'd be talking a maximum in South Africa of somewhere between 9 and, and 11 meters, absolute maximum. Therefore, you would go for FM2 special or FM2 as the case may be. Right. Cautions to make mention of them. There is no, I repeat, there is no uh, interrelationship between a VNA and an FM specification. If you've got people walking through your door telling you, I will give you an FM2 special floor and you need a little bit of grinding to get a VNA answer. The last guy we dealt with, I'm sorry to actually take personal experience here, but the last guy I've been told he wouldn't spend more than 300,000 Rand, he had to spend 1.6 million. Why? Why? Because the bloody floor cannot be interpreted just because it complies with FM2 or FM2 special, that that in any way relates to what's going to happen on a fixed path environment. In any way. In your FM2, you've taken readings every three meters. You've been taking them at 300 millimeter intervals if, if you don't have a profilograph, or at 10 millimeter intervals, and a, there's a hell of a lot of action that happens. So there's a lot of misleading going on, a lot of misunderstanding. Get a copy of TR34, read it, it's all in there. And, and that is the reason for that is, as I've just explained to you, the VNA criteria are based on absolute values. You've got to put a truck in an aisle. It's got no way it can move from left to right. It can only go top to bottom. So it, it is on a fixed or defined path. Therefore, you must meet the criteria requirements for the safe operation of that truck. When you go to FM, it's non-explicit. The other thing with regard to um, open floors, FM floors, just be aware of one thing. We see documents coming out now. Don't price it doing this floor if you don't have a laser screeder. There's nothing wrong with a laser screeder, but there's everything wrong with the application or lack of it of, of technology and thinking. If your concrete is difficult to move at 100 millimeter slump, that's not a problem. Put it in this collapse slump. If you know anything about concrete, any concrete's got water in it, it's got to lose it. Guess what happens? 
The lasers, first of all, are accurate to plus and minus one and a half millimeters. That's a good laser. Okay, so it's not that accurate at the end of the day. And now, as that free water bleeds off, you've got a mixture of tucks that have come in at different slumps. So you've got different setting times, different trialing times. You're trialing here and you're trialing there. You shouldn't be trialing here because it's too wet, etc., etc., etc. And last but not least, laser screeders do not finish floors. People with power floating machines do. So to summarize the importance of level and flatness specifications, in any V&A warehouse floor construction, compliance with the relevant level and flatness specification limits should be regarded as mandatory. Overseas, we haven't got to this stage in South Africa yet, but overseas what happens is a guy says, I have produced a DM1 floor. Somebody surveys it, it's nowhere near. He now comes along, and now what's he going to do? Well, he's going to take a look at the possible problems that are going to emerge for the poor guy that owns the facility. If he hasn't achieved, you could get a loss of wire guidance system. You want to see a warehouse man jumping up and down, try losing his signal. You can get load and rack collisions. These are kept secret because insurers uh, get upset if you wave them around. The last insurance claim we know was 40 million rand, and the insurers, international insurers, knocked it down to 35% of the claim. Why? Because they couldn't prove whether or not the floor was compliant. There were one or two other factors, but that was the primary one. So it's already well thinking you're getting away with it, but if anything goes wrong, and if it hasn't gone wrong in the first three or four months, well, maybe you don't need to worry about it. Worry about it, because these trucks wear out. So two and three years into the game, you might well find one morning it moves just a little bit too much and the game is on. Therefore, you've got potential for injury to personnel. In this day and age, I don't know how the hell any of us can walk onto a construction site. We have to have a risk assessment. My shoes, which cost me 2,200 Rand, are not good enough because they're not safety shoes, etc., etc., etc. And more importantly, from the point of view of the guy, if you are a developer, an engineer, or an architect, the guy that trusted you is going to get accelerated wear and tear on the main and, and, and increase in maintenance cost on his trucks. You might not like him. So have a good look at it, folks, because that's it. It's tough, but it's doable. We have plenty of examples in this country of it being doable. Unfortunately, only two companies have managed to do it. So any sections in any aisle, coming back to V&A, just for one moment from that picture, they need to be ground. When you come to grind, you need to think about what was happening with all those measurements that we were doing. So you're busy grinding away at point A on the left-hand wheel track, and quite frankly, you're kind of buggering up the longitudinal. You could be affecting the lateral. It is not a game for children. So do not use manual grinding, because manual grinding, aside from anything else, gives you a dishing effect down the line, and trucks don't like it. Your grinder has only got 380 millimeters worth of uh, working space, and in, in that dishing, the truck runs all over the shop. So you get equipment like this that grind for you. So I won't show you this because Brian's waving the, waving the gaps around, but this is what it looks like constructing a floor, and I don't have three minutes and 20 seconds to show you that, but I will show you that because that says that that piece of equipment is standing. You are nine meters off that floor, and he is lifting to 17 meters high. So now we move to a five-story building, and there's 1,850 millimeters face-to-face -face between those racks. So when I say it's doable, it's doable. And my last plea, which Brian knows rather well, we use this all the time. Of all the materials that you use in an industrial building, the only living element, the only one you shape when you're actually constructing that building is concrete. You get one chance to get it right. Would you please try and use that wisely? Thank you very much.